Hello dear friends and welcome to the Early Music Podcast. My name is Darina Ablogina and this season holds something truly extraordinary as we dive into the heart of the Early Music Summit. How can we embrace the bigger picture of research, education, performance and creation? How will we redefine our field in a more open, inclusive and balanced world? Join us in shaping the future of the early music scene with the Early Music Summit. In today's episode, we will talk with Isaac Alonso about audience development and its connection to conservatories and music academies. So uh, my name is Isaac. I am uh, originally from Spain. I uh, uh, moved to the Netherlands uh, as a student. Then uh, a few years later, I became uh, I became a teacher at the Royal Conservatoire. That is my main occupation. Let's say I share between teaching and performing, both in teaching and as well as in performing. My main focus is sort of like a redefinition of early music from the point of view of the early musical skills. And this means that I have been dedicating my, my research to recreating those, uh, those skills, uh, um, be it from the point of view of reading the sources, but also from the point of view of uh, improvisational skills or uh, things like solmization, things like uh, also basic music pedagogy, like uh, the Guidonian hand, uh, things like that are like... Uh, a kind of my everyday, uh, my everyday work. I um, collaborate with several ensembles. Most of them work on Renaissance or early Baroque music. And uh, I have my own ensemble, La Academia de los Nocturnos, that dedicates to Renaissance and Baroque music, let's say, from, uh, from Spain, with a little bit kind of like wider definition of Spain, because it's, uh, of course, in the early modern age, it was a different thing than now. You are working in association of European conservatories, academies, and Musik Hochschulen. Could you tell about this organization a little bit? Yeah, the the AEC or the European Association of Conservatoires and uh, Music Academies and Musik Hochschulen is an uh, European network dedicated to uh, culture in general, but more specifically education and inside education, the education in music. So uh, an association of conservatoires. It has around 300 member institutions by now in more than 50 countries. And it has gone a little bit also beyond, uh, beyond Europe. The mission of the AC, it's typically defined in three, in three aspects. One of it is fostering the, uh, the value of music education. The other is enhancing quality in higher music education. And the third uh, aspect or a third pillar would be promoting participation in, uh, in higher music education. Participation, inclusiveness, diversity, all these ideas. Specifically, I'm currently chairing the early music platform it has existed since uh, 2009 and nowadays it is uh, a task force which has um, the main objective of keeping alive activities uh, that relate to the to the field of early music within the AEC and uh, as such we typically connect very much with uh, REMA we also organize uh, events that have to do with music educators and uh, students etc and uh, also we have an online event um, that we have been uh, organizing in the past few years uh, that we call the Quod Libet and the Quod Libet is kind of like a Uh, early music online forum that is dedicated to uh, discuss on different aspects. And why is it crucial for conservatories to address the issue of audience management in the context of early music performance? I think there is like um, a perceived problem. I don't know if, if you would agree with this, but approximately around the, the last decade and a half, I have been perceiving this sort of thing. And uh, this sort of like feeling that uh, the appeal of the early music movement is not the same as it was before. 
as it was before, let's say, till, till around 2000 or 2005, um, early music had this countercultural uh, element in the 70s, for example, that meant that uh, audiences were uh, typically young. Yeah? And nowadays we still have the same audience, and with the same audience I mean probably even the same people. So there is like a, a gentrification of the audience of, of early music. It's not anymore that kind of countercultural that was very interesting for the younger generation. So that is one aspect. Uh, another aspect is that we have had many, many challenges, not only, not only us, I mean, not only early music, but um, uh, music in general and, and the cultural sector as a, as a whole, the financial crisis of 2007 with many cuts in budget and, uh, of course, the pandemics of 2020, 2021, 22, and then more general things like uh, globalization, which means that it is not so easy to find um, what is the audience for early music or not even to define what is is early music supposed to represent for audiences today? Not not to forget the whole uh, the whole aspect of the new media, uh, because nowadays we we have it completely as assumed. But but uh, I think it was something like 2000, 2005 or two thousand seven that that the first videos were uploaded to to YouTube. So it's not been so long. It is it is a recent thing. So maybe a decade and a half, or if you want, two decades, with many 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 changes. Um, in society, in the world at large, and uh, those things also have like effect, or let's say they are also challenges. I think it is a mixture of all these challenges that creates uh, the perception that there might be a problem having an audience now and in the future for early music, that we need to find some sort of renovation or we need to find some sort of like uh, newer strategies to uh, engage with, uh, with the society. And uh, could you share some examples of innovative audience uh, management strategies that have been successful? That I'm finding uh, nowadays everywhere is, uh, also in conservatories, I mean, um, is the, the idea of entrepreneurship inside uh, education. We have that all the time. So there's a growing presence of this topic in conservatory curricula. I think there is sometimes too much an effort on this whole idea of how to present yourself, emphasis in social media, maximize impact of uh, uh, online posts, so a little bit the idea becoming a little bit too much tilted towards the marketing of a product. And this means that it's very typical to find uh, new ensembles, fashionable ensembles and soloists, uh, kind of uh, uh, fad things. Yeah? And uh, then things like extravagant quirks and personalities are very much valued. For, for, but this is, this is short-lived. Uh, having the point of view, uh, as, at least the point of view that we have at the early music platform, that conservators might have or should have a deeper role to play uh, into this, engaging with society more than just the idea of finding an audience. Finding an audience, an audience performer repertoire is a little bit classical music way of looking at things. So it, it has a little bit uh, this uh, concert culture orientation. So what we are thinking now is just opening questions. We have no solutions for this. <laughs> we have questions. And uh, I think in a way it's the, also the, the, a little bit our obligation in the early music platform is to start uh, asking those questions and to try to foster discussion more than giving any sort of like uh, solutions. Do musicians today have a responsibility towards society? Engaging with society means not just developing audiences but considering music as heritage. So which roles can play early music in today's society? How can we engage with society in the sense that society, like it's not just an audience, but they have some sort of participation in what we are doing. But if we think about it, there is a great deal of early repertoires and of original performing uh, contexts which included varying levels of musical expertise already, historically speaking. Yeah? I typically put the example of Bach Passion as something closer to a school festival than to the idea of Werktreue that uh, we inherited a little bit from classical music in the sense that if you read the documentation of the time, you become aware that there were very different levels of uh, musical expertise taking part of the same musical event. Of course, from the top, uh, like Kappelmeister Bach, to the little choir boys that, that, uh, that the only thing that they were able to do is to sing a chorale. But they take part in the passion. This brings me to, to, to the question of like um, uh, something similar to that or something related to that. The idea of reintegration of early paradigms of music pedagogy in today's music, music pedagogy. This means, of course, early familiarization with, with the instruments. So 
Little kids can be familiarized with the instruments of early music. That's no problem at all. It doesn't mean that they have to become musicologists first and then see what is a harpsichord. They can get familiarized directly with the thing. But, but even going further, what happens if you teach the Guidonian hand or if you teach improvised counterpoint to little kids? Isn't the conservatoire also, in a way, as concert culture is, a central institution for the old paradigm of music, for the classical music paradigm, with, with where mus musicians are expected to be very much like uh, over specialized almost in a single instrument, etc. With this, with these sort of things. So these are some questions, and and we are going to have a series of um, guests in the event that we're preparing right now, also with this with this podcast, the event that is going to happen in uh, in uh, Brussels and, and Bruges. Uh, end of November, early December, in that long weekend that we're going to be there. One session is going to be hosted by us, by the, by the AEC. This program is being represented on an institutional level, right? How would an institution or a conservatory, how would they change their approach? And what would that mean for the students? Because, as you said, this concert perspective is very much present. And basically, we're still existing in this concert perspective. So how could we integrate that on an institutional level? That's something that has, still has to be done. Uh, we are there more or less with some aspects that are, of course, that have been developed for a long time already, that have to do with the whole idea of performance practice, that also has been improved or has been, um, let's say, enlarged, this idea, with original instruments beyond the instruments themselves. For example, there is a long tradition already of studying early music with the theoretical perspective of the of the time uh, the skill of counterpoint the skill of improvised counterpoint the skill of partimento the skill of improvising from a basso continuo part how can we put these things into into the conservatoire of course we we don't have a final a final answer but one way could be i'm going to make a, a kind of like a proposal for this i was for a while thinking about the idea of music plus x sort of like music for a lot of for for a long time and let's say for most of the repertoire that we are dealing with is not necessarily an essence separated from other arts or other aspects of, of, of life. Uh, so let's say there is a lot of functionality, if you want to put that word. Uh, I, I prefer to call it a bit more like integration with, all, with other aspects of, of, of life. For example, uh, ritual, music plus religion. Yeah? Or, for example, music plus dance, music plus theater, music plus uh, literature. So early music in context. I thought it's a fantastic idea that you mentioned this connection with environment, making music with amateurs, going to schools and showing them Guidonian hand. Uh, what I find it's missing in educational programs is how to survive after you are graduated from a conservatory and you are thrown into this sea of freelancers or people doing very cool stuff. And uh, are you planning on something like how to prepare younger specialists to this life? That is probably something that, uh, that is lacking in some curricula. So it's not so much the idea of uh, entrepreneurship, which can be very good, of course, but it is more the, uh, the idea that you have to see the world. You have to see how the world works. That was something completely natural in the old times, because when apprentice was doing the apprenticeship with a maestro, the uh, apprentice was living with the maestro. Yeah, oh my God. But you know, it was a school of life. 
in a way. So typically, the the young musician would be, uh, especially in uh, in some stages, would be um, deputizing for the for the maestro and would have to take on some of these uh, activities. So this is the whole idea that once we put the discipline inside the conservatoire, we close and we cut all the connections with the rest of society. The discipline has become an abstract thing. Yeah? And teaching music till the French Revolution, teaching music, and even, even later in some places, yeah? teaching music in the, in the French Revolution was teaching how to make a living out of music. So that is something that has happened also together with the idea that transformation of a, of a craft into a fine art that is studied in the conservatoire. Wow, it was a great conversation. Thank you very much, Isaac. This podcast series is a prelude to the Early Music Summit that will take place at Bazaar and Concertgebouw Bruges from November the 30th to December the 3rd of 2023. Stay tuned for our upcoming episodes as we dive deeper into the world of early music. In the next episode, we are going to talk about a special program called Early Muse. Don't miss out on the exciting discussions and discoveries that lie ahead. Thank you for tuning in and until next time, keep exploring the boundless horizons of early music.